Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this very special edition of Unboxed Lunch. My name is Nora, and we're thrilled you're joining us for lunch, which I'm enjoying here in Annapolis, Maryland today. Catherine Lee, our digital imaging technician, Jess Perkis, digital initiatives archivist, and Josh T. Franco, national collector, are joining us from our Washington, D.C. offices in the Victor Building. Today's event is a behind the scenes look at digitization at the archives through the artist and educator Mel Casas and his presence across multiple collections. Jess, Catherine and Josh will begin our exploration in just a few minutes. Before we get started, I want to let you know, oh, excuse me, before we get started, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. At any time during the webinar, you can submit your questions for Jess, Catherine and Josh which Josh will read as they digitize and discuss materials. To submit a question, just type it into the Q&A in the, or the chat at the bottom um, of your screen in that control panel there. Closed captioning is available. You can access uh, captions by clicking the CC live transcript button at the bottom of your screen. For this Unbox Lunch, I suggest that you set your Zoom view to gallery view so that you can see both Jess, Catherine, and the digitization process on Jess's camera and Josh on his camera in his office. You can go to the view button on the top right of your screen and select gallery. And now I'd like to introduce Catherine Lee, digital imaging technician, Jess Perkis, digital initiatives archivist, and Josh T. Franco, national collector at the Archives of American Art. Hi. Hi, Nora. Can you hear us all right? Yes. Perfect. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to this special edition of Unbox. I'm Josh T. Franco, the National Collector on the Curatorial Team at the Archives. Um, here with my colleagues who can introduce themselves. I'm Jess. I am the Digital Initiatives Archivist here at the Archives. I work a lot with putting our collections materials online, including um, digitization. And I am also the Transcription Center Coordinator, but a little more on that later. Hi, I'm Catherine. I'm the digital imaging technician here at the archives, and I work closely with the archivists to digitize materials. Great. So I think now Catherine and Jess are going to head down to the digitization room. Um, I think this is really great. Cecile on the camera in a few. This is a great way to get some insight into what happens after papers after me and the rest of the curatorial team brings them in. Um, and transcription and digitization are great uh, you know, functions that the archive serves. So a little bit about Casas, uh, while Jess and Catherine get themselves set up. Um, he was an educator and an artist and painter in San Antonio. He passed away in 2014. He leaves behind a great legacy, both in the form of his paintings, most notably his um, series of 150 works uh, that document Chicano and human experience through acrylic painting and oil, and um, also through his legacy of teaching. So, so many of the artists who are also represented in our collections um, were students of Casas. Kathy Vargas was one of them. We have Vargas's papers as well as her oral history. Uh, and I'm going to drop a quote about the uh, logical thinking of Casas and how it impacted Kathy um, in the chat right now. And I think this quote is particularly Poignant, this idea, you know, Kathy describing Casas's log logical linear thinking, um, because it's certainly, I never met Casas, but he was certainly a part of my education uh, as a, somebody who, an art historian who thinks about Chicano art. So um, I'm going to show you a couple of things quickly. So this is the Cata catalog, the Chicano Art Resistance and Affirmation catalog. Uh, this was a watershed exhibition in the early 90s that really brought Chicano art to mainstream uh, museum going audiences. In the catalog, Casas public is quoted, and you can see his quote is formatted kind of peculiarly in this box and as a bullet point list, all the other contributors have small poems uh, or just kind of regular prose. So why would it be formatted this way? Why is it designed this way? So if we go into the papers, we get a real clue. So I'm pulling out, these are from Mel Costas's papers himself. Um, and I just want to show you what his lecture notes look like, because you'll understand why they would be formatted that way as a quote. 
Uh, so here's a page. So all of his kind of notes, lecture, representations, there's folders of documents like this um, in his papers. Uh, it's a really unique way to shape your thinking and all very logical linear as, as Cappy observed. So uh, that's just one thing you could explore in his papers. He appears across collections and I'll bring up a couple of others um, as we go. But I see now that Jess and Catherine are ready. So Jess and Catherine, do you want to tell us what's going on over there? All right, um, this is Jess, everybody. Welcome to the digital imaging room. So what you're looking at is in fact, the camera stand for our digitization camera. You've basically got the same view that the digitization camera itself has. So that's what you're looking at. This is our first piece of material for the day. Some of the things that you maybe can't see, um, all of the lights are off in this room. The walls are painted a dark color. So everything is pretty dark. Um, we've got spotlights on the, on the stand, I didn't mention that. And um, we also have one computer set up with a Mac that has our photo editing software on it, which is called Capture One. So before we get started, just one quick word about what we're digitizing today. Um, we are digitizing the artist file for Mel Casas from the Tomas Ibarra Frosto Research Collection. And we are doing that because I would really like to include Mel Casas in our current transcription center initiative, which is called Celebrating 175. So for those who may not know the transcription center, um, it's one of our Smithsonian's digital platforms. It's probably the largest digital volunteering platform where users worldwide can explore, transcribe, and review all kinds of digitized collections materials, including um, our collections materials. We're a pretty um, big contributor there. So as I said, we have this initiative going on. It's in conjunction with the Smithsonian's 175th anniversary year. And during the course of the next year, we're gonna be launching um, projects that are related to 175 different US art world figures. So what you're seeing digitized today is going to be launched very soon now at the Transcription Center on November 24th, which was Casas's birthday. So if you can, please do come and join us on the Transcription Center um, on or after November 24th at about 10 a.m. when the projects launch and you can transcribe some of the documents you see here today. So if you do decide to do that, thank you very much. And if there are any Transcription Center volunteers here today, and there might be, thank you for all that you do. Um, collectively, you all have transcribed 115,000 of our um, documents so far. So I cannot thank you enough for the amazing work you do. So with all that said, let's get going, Catherine. Mm -hmm. So here in our digitization lab um, today, we you are currently looking at the golden thread color target. We use this target to read out um, the labs to make sure that the color, the exposure, the white balance, as well as our 600 PPI measurement is accurately captured. And with our camera, if you would like to. Um, one, one thing um, that I will say, we tend to use the terms scanning and digitization interchangeably, but I do kind of want to make it clear that we don't actually scan things on like a flatbed scanner here. We actually take digital photographs. Um, Catherine is our photographer. And um, we use a camera called a phase one IXG 100 megapixel, which is quite the camera. When it's up on its stand, it is taller than me. Can I just, I just want to chime in to add, I did this this morning, um, often when we have donors who are able to visit the DC headquarters, and I mean donors of papers who are thinking about giving their own papers or their family members papers uh, to us, I find it really effective to give them a tour of the archives and the digitization lab is one of the main highlights. Um, one, because it's painted black as just noted, 
it's always dark and often people are in there working and it's not obvious from the door. And that machine is uh, big and impressive and it's very much not an at-home flatbed scanner. Might be wondering what that little white slip of paper is. It's basically just a flag that has some instructions from me, the processing archivist, to Catherine on how she might best scan this particular piece of material as it folds out. Um, in another case, it might be telling her not to scan something. That might seem a bit counterintuitive, but we don't actually scan every single piece of material. If it's a blank page or a duplicate, um, irrelevant material, we don't scan those. But we also don't scan materials that might include um, personally identifiable information or have some very, very sensitive things on it. Jess or Catherine, what is the, have you ever scanned something particularly strange? Because I know we're mostly paper, but we other things uh, enter our collection sometimes. Um, absolutely. Um, I don't know, do you, do you have a favorite already, Catherine? Um, sometimes we have very fragile material that requires lots of delicate handling and materials that we can't quite use acrylic plexiglass as I'm using here to flatten down due to its fragility or um, you know its ability to handle pressure. So I would have to you know very carefully find ways to digitize that without harming the material such as um, onion skin or paper that's, paper that's crinkling at the edge. That's great. Uh, and now, you know, y'all are, we're, what you're scanning now is a lot of printed material that has great research value and is beautiful. But while you're doing that, I want to show some more uh, unique materials that are in Mel Costas's papers, by which I mean photographs in this case. And there you see Mel um, at an exhibition. We love photographs of exhibitions because, of course, most art shows are not permanent. They're up for three or four months and seeing how things were hung in relation to one another into a space is really valuable for researchers. And Jess, I believe Mel Costas's papers that I'm showing you now, these have been digitized, correct? Yes, the Mel Costas papers are fully digitized. Um, the bulk of them have also been put through the transcription center. Um, after November, pretty much everything that can be transcribed will be transcribed from his papers. So you'll be able to keyword search the materials as well on one of our online archives websites. And Jess, Costas really brings up an interesting challenge we've talked about before, because again, I'm gonna show one of these diagrams that are so prevalent in his papers. What would, the what would a transcription center volunteer be instructed to do with this? I don't imagine they're told to reproduce the shape of the words. Yeah. No. Um... Basically, what we decided to um, to have them do is to mark mark the diagrams with a flowchart kind of tag in their transcription text, and then to transcribe the text in as logical an order as they can um, can do. And obviously, that that is subjective, but we can't replicate, you know, as you said, the shapes or the like images. Like we see right now, yeah. Yeah. Um, and a, a good question from Janice Ekdahl. How do you scan, photograph a volume of newspaper clippings with a one inch or more spine? Interesting question. For, hi, Catherine speaking. For bounded material, um, I usually, if it's able to, I slide it down with plexiglass, or if it's on the more fragile side, I would take capture it one page at a time, where I would hold one side of the spine, flex the other side, and then just crop that in post-production. So very careful scanning and then post-production. That's what capture one is for. Right. So I'll just, so when I walk in on someone in the digitizing lab working away like Catherine, um, 
Sometimes they're standing at the, the bed of the, the camera doing what you see now. Sometimes they're looking at the computer monitor that's attached doing the color corrections, the cropping, the repositioning. Kind of as a general rule, uh -huh. um, things that we do scan, basically anything that has relevant intellectual content. Relevant right. is the hard part, obviously, but um, that is what we scan. Doesn't matter if it's the back or the front of a piece of material, we will scan it. Jess and Catherine, Kevin Koppel asked, do you scan under glass or over glass? I believe you have a piece of glass you just you demonstrated. You might show again. Yes, Catherine speaking. Whenever we use a piece of glass, um, I place it over the, the color target so I can get an accurate reading. And plus, when you use it, it darkens down the exposure tab. So I always go in post-production and add about 0.2 or 0.3 in exposure so that the lab readouts are accurate. Thank you. Um, we have another question. Do you also have a cruise scanner, C-R-U-S-E scanner for larger pieces or highly reflective pieces? Kevin speaking again. For larger pieces, we use a technique called stitching. Um, pieces that are bigger than you know our table right here, which is probably you know, 36 by 36. We capture them in sections and then go into Photoshop later to stitch them together as one photo. Thank you, Catherine. Um, so while we're waiting for more questions to roll in, I want to point out um, something else in another collection. This is Mel Casas Across Collections, after all. So besides the Malcostas papers, the Tomasi Boa Frouster papers, which is what you're seeing Justin Catherine work with now, the portion um, relevant to Casas, uh, and three or four oral histories he appears in, we, um, it was, you know, a collection I was able to steward myself uh, with the Nancy Kelker research materials related to Malcostas. So research materials about a particular artist or theme is a whole uh, kind of subcategory of our collections. Um, because they're often really unique and val research valuable material. So um, Nancy Coker published the book Cultural Adjuster about Melkosis. Cultural Adjuster was the term he used to describe his own activity. It was uh, the term that was on his business card he would hand out to people. Our interim director, Liza Kerwin, received one of these from Melkosis in the past. Um, so cultural adjuster is a really interesting term and um, what he described his work as. So here we have a little cassette tape. And Jess, I wonder, let's talk about digitizing audiovisual uh, material maybe a little bit if you want to chime in. This is a um, little tape. It's uh, the label on the folder is Casas interviewed by Vincent Valdez, who's a um, younger artist. So just continuing to show how Casas um, legacy just lasts and lasts. So Vincent Valdez is an excellent painter. Uh, I'm really, you know, this is one of those things I want to get digitized so I can hear myself. Um, Jess, do you have a sense if this is in Casas's papers, would this have been, I know AV, we treat a little differently than paper as far as, and you know, it's a little trickier to digitize. Yeah. Um, the AV basically goes through an entirely different kind of work process. Yeah. Um, we also, do that on a Mac. I'm afraid I am not incredibly well versed in that particular workflow because yeah. I work with the textual materials. But um, right, well, that's that can be the next lunch bag. But uh, just so people are aware, and um, yes, I love that there's an interview by Vincent, but gathered by Nancy Kelker in the process of writing this book about Casas. So we have more questions. Um, anonymous attendee asks, I'm curious about what metadata might be assigned to these photos, or is all the quote unquote meta info subsumed included in the cataloging of the archival collection as a whole unit? Let me know if you want me to repeat that. Yeah, could you please repeat that? Yes. 
I'm curious about what metadata might be assigned to these photos, or is all that meta info subsumed included in the cataloging of the archival collection as a whole unit? Okay. Um, one, one quick, quick thing. We've actually moved on to the Consafo file. I um, saw that, are, yeah. We are also digitizing. I just wanted to note that as we were going. Um, so we do have technical metadata that gets embedded in the photographs as we take them. Um, you know, I, IPTC kind of stuff. We also have um, kind of this validation process that will um, that basically assigns the photographs to a box folder in our kind of finding aid structure. So we can we know where the image is from as we ingest it into our digital asset management system. Um, in terms of descriptive metadata, though, um, that is primarily something that is part of the collection description in the finding aid. But there are various levels to that, if that makes sense and answers your question. Yeah, and all our finding aids are available online, so I encourage you to explore them to see how information is organized there. I love all the technical questions. And um, we have another from Lorna Notch. When, how is this? Is the decision made to not scan and maybe take photos or some other method? And I mean, I, I think scanning and photographing is something, Jess, you, you like to clear up with folks actually, right? Yeah, um, I mean, if I'm, if I'm understanding correctly, and if I'm not, please, please do correct me. Um, we photograph everything, basically. That's not, um, not necessarily a, a decision that we make, if that makes sense. Yeah, photographing is our default. That's what you're doing now. We yeah. should we we use the word scanning loosely around the archive. Maybe we should be okay. more careful. We, we should be maybe yeah. more even more plain. Yeah. We, yeah, we say scanning because it's easier to say than digitization. Yeah, let's let's be real here. Um, but it's it's the same photographing process. As for deciding what does and does not get scanned, that's um, kind of a more complicated process of appraising the material. It could be too fragile. We wouldn't scan it in that case. Um, found materials are difficult. So right. we have to kind of take that on a case by case basis. Um, as we, um, I guess I should also say that we, we process things for digitization. So we go through all the material in the folder and look to see whether it's relevant as a processing archivist yeah. before we ever put them beneath the camera. Yeah. Um, I want to go back to Consafos and what historically significantly that means. But first, I just also just want to um, talk about why these are being, I think this is a digitization on demand request you're responding to, but if not this particularly, can you talk about DOD a little bit? It's um, one sure. of my favorite things we do. Um, I do work on our digitization on demand service. We call it DOD for short. Um, basically, it's a service, if, you, if you're not familiar with it, where someone anywhere in the world who has an internet connection can request that a folder of our collections material be digitized. We can do this through our website. Yep, that's that's the request sheet that we uh, we do. Um, Did you just then, digitize the request sheet? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but we will um, we'll scan it in house like we're doing right now, and then we will deliver it to you digitally. There is there is a small fee associated with that, but um, what I love about that is that it you know it goes to the person who requested it, of course, but it also goes on our website, and it's sort of like you're doing a great service to the field by um, requesting them for yourself. Because once we digitize, we make them available online as well. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Had so. Um, from... Oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to wanted to mention. So Casas was a member of the collective Consafo. 
which was a San Antonio based collective of Chicano artists, um, one of the most important collectives uh, in American art, not just Chicano art, um, but along with in California counterparts like the Royal Chicano Air Force, um, kind of counter counterparts like OSCO. Uh, but a lot of Chicano art was formed through these collectives. And Gonzafos, I don't know if Jess, if you have a document with that insignia handy to show. Um, is always signified with the C slash S. Uh, so it shows up a lot in Costas's papers as a mark, but all over the place. Um, because I am myself a Chicano from West Texas, it's a mark that's been in my life growing up. I saw my mom shared her, my parents were high school sweethearts and they're still together, but their high school love letters have that mark on them at the end after their signatures. Um, and I don't know, Jess, should I show my tattoo? Are we going there? Go for it. Okay. Going have, there. One more audience question. Let me see, it's on my foot. I'll try to um, not mess up the camera too much. So my foot is not near any papers, by the way. I don't know if that's gonna work. You can see a little blurry black mark. Yes, we can that's see the blurry black mark. <laughs> It was a wonderful sure. attempt. It was a great but attempt. You can tell we didn't rehearse that. I didn't know if I wanted to or not. Uh, but it, the, so it's on my body. And it's a really meaningful mark. And I love that it's in the archives, sort of infiltrating the, the American art history. Um, so <laughs> after that goofy attempt to show the tattoo, one more serious question. Thank you for bringing us back. Um, how do you digitize photographic materials, prints, negatives, transparency, tin types, et cetera? Transparency is, is an interesting question. Jess, Catherine? Catherine speaking. For negatives and transparencies, we actually use a light box and we place it where the camera is, but we zoom down to 800 PPI. Um, I do, oh, I actually do have an example for you right here. This is the light box that we use. Um, and we just place the transparency on top of there and we turn on the light, which I do not have plugged in at the moment. But this is how we would digitize um, our, oh, here we go. <laughs> Theoretically, if we had a slide, a negative or a strip of film, we could put it on here and digitize it as we do with our other material. Amazing. I didn't even know that. That's great. Thanks, Catherine. Um, we're wrapping up here. There's more questions and I encourage you please to send them um, to us and we will get them answered for you offline. But there's one I would like to answer publicly because I think it's so good and comes up a lot. Do you prefer to receive material which has already been digitized or does that potentially cause problems because of incompatible digital formatting? Yes. <laughs> Such a good conversation, and the, the that's the, the, one of the questions that me and the other collectors have with donors, um, because you know the impulse to digitize, we of course sympathize with and understand, and um, you know, well, one thing that is we don't automatically digitize when we commit to acquire a collection, we do commit to minimal level processing and writing a finding aid, but digitization is not automatic, um, so. That's usually a factor in the conversation, but correct those the way we have very specific digitizing spec, specs, which is what you're seeing Catherine and Jess run through now. So it would be incompatible and um, we would we do collect born digital material, but we wouldn't collect born digital surrogates of paper things that we were also receiving. So um, it's always case by case. It's always naughty. Uh, you know, there's always smaller questions for each case, but in general, that your, I think what your instinct is in asking that question is correct. Um, we would not receive, we would not take things that have already been digitized when the paper originals are also available. And Nora, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Josh. And thank you, Catherine and Jess. This was fantastic. I'm so sorry we didn't get to more or on the entirety of your questions, which were all really great. Um, if you want to send them to me, I am happy to pass them along and we can continue the conversation. My email is danielsn at si.edu. That's daniels, D-A-N-I-E-L-S, n at si.edu. I would be glad to pass those along. 
Thanks everyone again, this was fabulous. Um, I wanna let you know that support from friends like you makes programs like Unbox Lunch possible and allows us to share our collections and our processes <laughs> with uh, users around the world. Hi, Jess and hi, Catherine. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so thank you for that. Um, thanks everyone for their support, especially during um, COVID, it's allowed us to keep sharing the legacy of American art with friends around the world. So if you'd also, if you'd like your gift to be recognized during Unboxed Lunch, that is possible. And I'd love to talk to you about that. You can email me, same email address, we can talk about that. And to support the work of our archivists and our collectors, you can always visit aaa.si.edu slash support. Thank you so much. Have a great day. Have a nice holiday. Enjoy the fall and we'll see you next month. Thank you.